Welcome to the Evolving Digital Self Podcast, where we explore the conscious use of technology. Listen in to hear thought leaders and other guests discuss the human relationship with technology and learning to thrive in the digital era. Hosted by the author of the international best-selling digital self-mastery series and being at work, Dr. Heidi Forbes Usta. Welcome back to the Evolving Digital Self Podcast. Today, I am so excited to share my friend, Monica Parker from Hatch Analytics with you. She is doing the coolest stuff in the space of design and communication, organization change. You know, she's doing so many different facets of this work that I think it's actually almost better to have her introduce herself so I don't mess it up. So welcome, Monica. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do and where you're coming from? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Heidi. This is awesome. Um, so Hatch. Hatch is actually a human analytics and change consultancy specializing in the future of work. And that's basically what I do. I, I help people understand the impact that space has on behavior, certainly what technology has on behavior as well, and then help them lead culture change within their organization. So really about future of work and all the ways that impacts our organizations. Very cool and so critical in today's world. So Monica and I met at this really cool conference called Masters and Robots of all things in Warsaw. And it just really, one, her personality just shined out. And I thought, wow, she'd be a perfect person to have on the podcast. But the other was you had some really great data that just really expressed some of the challenges in the current marketplace, everything from generational to the way that we respond to change. Can you share some of that? Sure. Trying to think, uh, going back to, to our time in, in Warsaw. I mean, there's a huge amount of research being done around the, the impact of technology and the way that the future of work is changing. I mean, one of the statistics that, that really pops into my head that I recall was around the number of jobs that uh, that young people will have during the course of their life. So a, a child entering the workforce today or a, a young adult entering the workforce today will have 17 jobs in five industries. And when I think about that, what that really says to me is that we've got to get so much better at managing change, at resiliency, and at our adaptability within organizations than certainly we are today. Absolutely. And resiliency is such a key word there. You know, it's funny, in looking at your bio, I see, I just saw this pop out of, you know, author, speaker, designer, CEO, activist, clown, opera singer. These are a few things that are not your typical bio, but talk about having resilience and ability to adapt to change. I think that's so cool. How did that path evolve and bring you to a place uh, working with organizational change and Hatch Analytics? Yeah, you know, it sounds a bit wacky, but it makes perfect sense to me. I studied design in undergrad, so I've always had a real keen interest in understanding how design, good design, poor design affects behavior, affects how we feel about space. And after I graduated from university, a lot of people go on to get their grad degree. Some go into the Peace Corps. What I wanted to do to make a difference was I'm very much against the death penalty and wanted to try to have an impact in that regard. So I became a homicide investigator for the Department of Justice, working with men and women on Florida's death row, actually with the defense teams to try to exonerate them, to get them off death row. And from that work, I became really fascinated by the well-being impacts and the mental health implications that space has on us. I'm um, seeing what happens to people when they are in a prison cell for 23 hours a day. Also looking at community and how community can lift people up out of situations where they seem to have no choices and how um, surrounding ourselves with the wrong kinds of communities can actually be one of the biggest influences on why people make the bad decisions that they do make end them up on, say, death row. And that really, to me, I thought, well, what difference can I make in the world? People spend more waking time in their workplaces than they do just about anywhere else. And I thought, if I can make 
better work, then I think I can make a better world. And so to me, bringing the knowledge that I have from the world of criminal justice really has influenced the way that I'm able to see office and corporate environments and ways to improve people's work lives. Oh, and what a gift that is. I think so few people are actually willing to take that stand and really use their gifts in the workplace to help change happen more fluidly. Because as you mentioned before, change is what we're going through right now. And it's something we've got to get used to and and be more resilient about. But you didn't touch on the singer. So I'm going to come back to you on the singer piece because I want to know. This is something that so I (laughs) since we last met... I had this, you know, I was basically called, and I've never really understood what that meant before, but this was truly a sort of calling experience to bring back music into my life. Because I don't know if I told you, but I used to be a singer-songwriter, and I played in coffee houses for 10 years. And so when I saw I that on your that. bio, I was like, oh, how cool. She's also a singer. So... I find that for me, that makes me very tuned into sound and acoustics and to how, how sort of the melody and flow of things. Do you feel the same way or how do you find your opera singer background impacts your current work? Well, I was classically trained singer. I've been singing since I was, uh, I don't know, probably about six, all through school. I toured Europe with a choir just before entering university, and it's just been a love of mine. And I was a singer in Cape Cod as well and had the most surreal experience of singing the national anthem at Fenway Park in front of 60,000 people. So that was that was definitely a, um, that was a challenge. That was overcoming some severe stage fright when you get out onto that mound. Understanding harmony and dissonance from the point of view of, I see there's a real synergy in the way that organizations work. And so I think that it has given me a different perspective of of seeing those harmonics. And also, I think from a design point of view, that you can start to see a theme that, as you do with music, that design doesn't have to be heavy handed to tell a story in the same way that music can be can have such a brevity to it and yet can be so powerful. And I think the lessons of less is more from music power of the individual, I've definitely see that from reflecting in workplace design and how teams can work as well. It's funny, I was just in a session today with a client running a, a session we call operating rhythms. And to me, that idea of finding that rhythm with your team is very real. It's not just a word that we use because it's reflective of music. There is a rhythm, a pattern that we have with people when we work well together. And yeah, so I, I, I think there, there is that alignment. I love that. And I think it's really, it's a powerful tool that we can use and in bringing in the creative side to work that sometimes maybe doesn't feel so creative or, or maybe doesn't normally sort of draw that piece. But when you can integrate it, you can get some pretty incredible results with people because we are naturally creative. Absolutely. So, yeah. I, and I'm curious in, in your experience, particularly in the last 10 years where the smartphone has become such a predominant tool that we all use. How have you seen technology change your work and the way that you work with teams and the way that people respond to the type of work that you're doing? Absolutely. I mean, everything has has changed in the last 10 years since the, the advent of the smartphone. And it's interesting because I work with clients who are moving into new work homes. And, you know, typically the lease period that they're signing is a 10-year lease with a five-year break. And think back 10 years ago is when the smartphone was invented. What will change in the next 10 years? It's it's so hard to to be able to sort of propel yourself forward with the rate of change. But I think the key element of, of mobility, now the baseline for organizations is mobility and mobility tools. And the ability to be able to, to work anywhere, anytime has 
has transformed just our entire relationship with work. And some would say for better or for worse, our data still says that people feel more empowered than disempowered by the use of smartphones, that certainly there are etiquettes that need to be created so that we don't create a world of overwork, which there is, you know, we do still like to worship at the um, altar of the cult of overwork. I think that is a problem. Certainly, they say that the World Health Organization says it's an epidemic at this point, overwork and issues related to that. But I still see technology as a positive if we harness it in the right way. But being able to be mobile has changed all of our expectations with work from work design to flexible working, the ability to to work from home. Now, flexible working is the single biggest non-remuneration benefit that people request in the OECD. So that ability to not have to be in the office all the time and down to even just the way that our social lives are now, this idea of work-life balance, which really wasn't even a thing very much before um, the advent of the smartphone. So you can't estimate the amount that it's changed how we work. Absolutely. And I'm curious because you work very globally for those of, I guess we didn't even mention that you're in London. I'm, t- I'm, I'm talking to you from California and you're in London and you do a lot of work in yep. many different markets. What kind of variation do you see in terms of adaptation to technology, resistance, overuse? Is that unique in different markets or is that pretty much the same everywhere? It's fairly ubiquitous. The Asian markets, there is a faster adoption of new technology and new apps in the Asian market. I would certainly say that within the EU in particular, in France, there are rules that are being put in place to try to limit the exposure to intrusions in the in home life from being available all the time on our smartphones. I have differing opinions on that. I think that, you know, when you get too far into the nanny state, that that really isn't helping anybody because you're not learning to manage things yourself or with your team. But that is certainly a, a difference I've seen. But in general, it's pretty ubiquitous. This is a, an extension of our physicality. And without it, people feel just incapable of functioning. Do you work much in developing markets? And and if so, do you find that the adaptation is different in a way that it may expose them to new markets that they wouldn't necessarily be exposed to? Or or is there more and, and also is there more of a protection of their culture, maintaining their, their cultural value systems as they're very different? We, we work in some, I mean, it depends your, your definition of developing, but certainly we work in certain developing nations, but because our work is focused on traditional workplaces, we're still working in an office environment. And what we would say is that in general, knowledge workers globally are more the same than they are different. So from our survey tool now, we have about 40,000 respondents from 30 countries globally. And what we find is the things that define a knowledge worker more often than not is their job role. So you are more, say, a developer than you are an American. So the differences between responses of an office worker in America, say in in L.A., versus London, versus Mumbai, their responses on what they need, what drives them, what they want, is going to be more similar across their job role than across the region. So actually, the the tightest sinew is job role, then frequently, after a certain amount of tenure, the next is actually the company you work for, and then third is your region. So Americans love to think that they're unique special flowers, and the French love to think they're unique special flowers, and the British do as well, and yet... Every individual is unique, but our behaviors are more consistent with the people who share job roles than they are with than our neighbors, which I think is really fascinating. That is fascinating, and it totally makes sense. I mean, you know, having worked as an expat for most of my career, I, that was what I experienced as well, is that, you know, the people we were working in similar job areas, that's the culture that we shared. We each brought our unique perspectives to that, yep. but in terms of our work culture, it was very much based on our different roles. So that's, that's interesting. And, and to me, you know, that was not necessarily before the smartphone, but you know, I took five years off to go do my research piece. So there's certainly been a gap there. So it, it hasn't changed that much, which is actually, I think, very exciting to see. 
One thing that I'm kind of curious about, you touched on it earlier a little bit, but maybe not necessarily in the words of placemaking. But I think the whole thing of placemaking is becoming much more integrated into how we think about design of workspaces. And for those of you who are not familiar with uh, placemaking, it's really about creating spaces that encourage people to interact on a very basic level. That's, I think, a, a definition that people can relate to. Do you find that that becomes integrated into your work? And and on the digital, is there different things that you need to consider when you're trying to do placemaking for knowledge workers, creating a space to get them to interact more? Absolutely. The placemaking is a huge initiative among the larger architectural installations. So when you start looking at entire buildings and groupings of buildings and how that impacts communities, there's a term that we use a lot in our work that the design is becoming more porous. And so while you used to need permission to enter, say, a building, now the floor of a number of buildings may be community space. A, a great example of that are some of the bigger banks. I'm thinking of the ANZ building in in Melbourne, where the ground floor has a cafe that's open to the public. It has a co-working space that's available for people to use. And it ends up being a space that also the employees of the building use. But it's that porosity, that idea that, that almost now every building or every workspace should have, or we encourage them to have a public, a privileged, and a private area. Um, it used to be that it was that as soon as you entered, that was the, the privileged and the private. But to have that public space that allows for that greater fluidity, that greater those greater bump opportunities with not just the people you're working with, but the community as a whole. And that porosity, I think, is going to be something we're going to see more and more of. And it's going to be one of the indicators of a, of a modern workplace. I love that term, that it's more porous. That makes so much sense. And I mean, I even saw that uh, recently. I was on college tours with my son And some of the schools were actually putting cross-disciplinary faculty together on floors rather than having departments separated for a similar type environment, like for cross-fertilization, new ideas. You don't get stuck in sort of one particular thing. So I think they're even thinking about that. We're going to take a really quick break to hear from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Oscar Wellness. When pain stops, life begins. Oscar Pulse mimics the body's own recovery processes to relieve pain, muscle stiffness, and inflammation using optimized pulsed electromagnetic field technology, PEMF, to encourage recovery at a cellular level so you can get back to life. And I gotta tell you, this thing works so well, my husband and I are fighting over it. So I highly recommend you take a moment and try it out. They have all kinds of options for checking it out, and they've even given us an opportunity to share a discount with you, $55, by using the 2BU code on the OSCO Wellness site. You can check out the show notes to get more details. And we're back. So we we were touching a little bit on placemaking there, but I would like to shift a little bit into talking a little bit more about Monica and your use of technology as a global knowledge worker yourself. How has your life and work changed in your relationship with technology over your career? Well, I can't say that I'm probably, maybe do as I say, not as I do. If you were to ask my husband and business partner how I deal with technology, he would say I don't have the healthiest relationship. I am pretty much plugged in 24-7. But I think some of that is also given that, yeah, I am the founder of, of my company. And so it's something I'm not able to separate work and life. It's just life for me. But I love the ability that it gives me to create the life that I want. When my husband and I started Hatch, we didn't set out to be billionaires, which is good because we're not going to be. But the main thing we said is we want to make a difference in people's work lives. We want meaningful work and we want to be location in specific. So our goal 
always was to be able to work from anywhere that we wanted to and still be able to deliver great work. And so, for example, I lived in Nice for December and January um, last year, and I'll be there for three months this coming winter because it's just a very centering place for me. And we were able to, I was able to write and create and yet still run my business from there. We have an office in in London, two offices in London. We've got an office in Melbourne. We're opening our office in in New York. And that fluidity, that ability to to be anywhere that I want to be from a personal or professional point of view is, is a game changer. And I think it's why I've been able to find such satisfaction in the work that I'm doing because I am able to be so mobile um, and constantly challenge myself with, with new places, with new projects and new thinking. I love it. What are some of the favorite technologies that you use that work, help you have that fluidity in your uh, ability to be able to work from different places and, and also be able to take care of yourself? Yeah, I mean, I love my smartphone. Within my team, we use Slack, and we've just started piloting Asana, which is a sort of a project management and agile tool. But I, you know, in at the end of the day, I am a woman in her mid forties. I love my email. I love Twitter. I've, I think I've fallen out of love with Facebook lately, but I think that for me, Twitter as a professional tool has been incredible. It allows me to, to really get a lot of of emotional support from this incredible growing group of professionals, the majority of them women, and to be able to stay in touch with them globally, that's been an unexpected, I guess, side benefit of social networks. And so I, I do find social networks are a very positive influencer for me. And, and I, yeah, I love just a, a good old FaceTime conversation with my with my parents or my friends who are now because I've lived globally I have friends that are all over the world too so to be able to connect with them and see them face to face that's just amazing I agree with you on that 100% and I'd say one of the few features from Facebook that I the, one of the reasons I will never go off is my favorite is the birthday feature because it is all of a sudden uh, for it's usually because it goes over a couple of days because there's a few people that get the notice that it's my birthday in Australia time. But then there's people that are giving, doing belated birthday things. But just hearing from everybody and seeing everybody's faces pop up is such a gift of all the different people that I've crossed paths with over the years. And it's a silly little thing, but I've found that it's very profound for me. It sort of gives me a boost every year. So there are some really sweet gifts that come from social media. And then certainly Twitter is a great way to sort of keep a pulse on what's going on and be able to check in with people and say, hey, you know, you need a little support here? Great. You know, let me give you a boost. Pretty cool stuff. Do you use technology at all for self-care in anything from a wearable for fitness or for, do you use technology in other ways, meditation apps or anything like that for yourself? I do. I do. I, um, I use, I wear a Fitbit and I also, um, use Insight Timer, which is an app for meditation. And I find that particularly helpful uh, because it tracks all your meditation and and sort of gamifies it. So you're able to see if you've missed a day, which I try not to do. Um, I do try to meditate every day and do yoga and tracks that as well. And I'm always amazed at the sophistication of these apps that are totally free. So Insight Timer is completely free. And, and I'm just amazed at, at the, the level of functionality. I think how, you know, how, how do they do this? But it's uh, I've, I've found that to be really helpful. It sort of just gives me that little reminder of that you made this promise to yourself. Don't forget. And so I, I do find that that's very helpful. Yeah, no, I think Insight Timer is one that people often cite when I ask them that question. And my kids even use it, which is pretty cool. You know, the teenagers are doing it on their own initiative. Nobody said, you know, you need to be doing this. So I think there's some great tools out there that are so accessible. You don't have to be super techie and you don't have to be a super meditator either to <laughs> to do to use those Absolutely. tools. Absolutely. So very cool. I want to make sure that people can find your work and sort of understand sort of how they could potentially work with you. Can you share with the listeners a little bit more about where do we find Hatch Analytics? What kinds of things do you do? And Absolutely. So you can find Hatch at 
hatchanalytics.com. You can follow us on Twitter um, or sign up for our Hatch Dust um, newsletter. That We've got a, a, a good um, Twitter presence where we have Methodology Mondays talking about the different types of methodologies approaching social science in the workplace. We, um, we get you ready for your week on Sundays with information about how to prep for the week and, and to fire you up. We do a poll every week on Wednesdays as well, and you can wait for the output of that. And we try to track what, what people are thinking and feeling when it comes to, um, to work. And what is it that we do? We use data to inspire positive action and change in workplaces and ways of working. So if you know anyone that wants to change their culture or their way of working and, and needs a little, a little help, then please look us up. And I'm also on the speaking circuit. So I would love to see any of your happy faces out in an audience someday. And please come and introduce yourself. Awesome. And I think you've got some uh, events coming up as well. Aren't you doing Inspire Fest? So I, I believe you were involved in that one as well, weren't you? Yeah, absolutely. So let's see, I'll be in Australia at the end of May at the Future of Work Summit. Um, and then in June, I'll be at Inspire Fest. I'm very proud to say that I'm on the um, advisory board of Inspire Fest. I think it's one of the most exciting events globally and certainly in Europe. And it's uh, just an incredible collection of diverse collection of new thinking around science, technology, and the arts and how they intersect. So um, big fan of InspireFest and uh, as well as, as the work of Singularity Use. There's so, so much opportunity to connect with new thinking and maybe we'll see Heidi at InspireFest as well. Uh, maybe, unfortunately, not this year, but maybe next year. Unfortunately, I had a conflict this year, but I will definitely shoot for it next year. It's been such a treat to have you on today. And I, you know, I hope for those of you listening that you will look up Monica's work with Hatch Analytics and try to catch her next speaking gig. She's a great speaker, super fun and a great person. So make sure you go take, take a chance to go say hello if you do see her speak in person. Thank you so much for joining us today, Monica. This has really been a treat. And I look forward to our paths crossing face to face sometime again soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Heidi. You have a terrific day. Thank you. And for those of you listening, thank you for joining us with Monica and Hatch Analytics. This is Evolving Digital Self. We look forward to you joining us next time. Until then, bye-bye for now. Thank you for joining us for the Evolving Digital Self. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app now so that you don't miss a single episode. While you're at it, please give us a rating and a review and join the digital self-mastery movement to create more conscious use of technology by sharing it and telling your friends. Want to see where you fit on the digital self spectrum and how it might be impacting your business and relationships? Get your free copy of Digital Self Mastery today by clicking on the link in the show notes.